So it's my pleasure to welcome here today, this early morning on a Sunday. Uh, we are here to see how we can increase ambitions to deal with the climate emergency. The UN RED program was launched at the UN Climate Summit back in 2008 by the then UN Secretary General and the Prime Minister of Norway. Pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, and thank you to UN RED for the important work that you have been doing over the past decade. Since uh, RED Plus was formally launched at Bali, uh, we've had almost 12 years of good news and bad news. And I think I'll uh, start with the bad news. Because uh, despite some significant progress, uh, we are currently not on track. Instead of forests slowing climate change, forest destruction is still driving climate change. The uh, recent New York Declaration on Forest Assessment Report, the IPBES Global Assessment on Biodiversity and Land Use, and the report on Food and Land Use Coalition all confirm this pretty grim truth. Uh, data from uh, Global Forest Watch also shows a loss of tree cover equivalent to the area of France, Germany and the UK combined in the last decade. This is a crisis uh, and it is a crisis of existential proportions. We either deal with it or leave future generations a planet heading towards ecological collapse. But there are also some good news. In fact, nature-based solutions can provide up to one-third of the mitigation needed uh, up to 2030. Uh, within that, forests provide the largest potential. However, forests have only received a small fraction of the attention and the climate finance that it deserves so far. So, how do we get this right? First, um, the case for action is stronger than ever. No one questions the benefits of halting and reversing deforestation for sustainable development. Um, the consequences of inaction will be disastrous and would not be something our planet will be able to sustain. Uh, however, it is fully possible to produce the food, the feed, and the fuels the world needs while staying within our planetary boundaries. But to do so, we must use our land in a much smarter way than we are doing currently. We must fundamentally transform the world's food systems over the next decade. The deforestation-free supply chain movement must succeed and go global and we must encourage a shift in global diets. Second, we know what it will take. Stopping deforestation primarily comes down to public policies. It's about regulations, it's about enforcement, and it's about incentives. Regulations, well, a large part of the climate solution lies in simply providing protected status or clear tenure rights to forests with no formal land use category. Enforcement. In Guyana, for example, significant cuts in deforestation have in large part been achieved due to better enforcement. Indonesia has stepped up enforcement of its peat and logging moratorium and initiated a legal review of existing licenses. This has resulted in a steady decrease in deforestation, um, both in 2017 and last year. Colombia's armed forces are being deployed to regain control over rural areas, protect the forest and build peace. And finally, to incentives. Too often, domestic public finance promotes rather than discourages deforestation. But subsidy schemes can be modified to grow rural economies without driving deforestation. The uh, G20 agreed to phase out harmful fossil fuel subsidies and hence changed national policies. We now need a global push to minimize deforestation from agricultural subsidy schemes. I applaud the UN RED program for helping countries in improving such public policies. 
As for Norway, our strategy uh, has evolved and broadened since 2008. Paying for reduced emissions remains a core part of our strategy because international payments provide a political incentive as well as a financial one. Now, a um, few hundred million dollars will never convince tropical forest countries to do something against their will. We have only paid for a small share of countries' results, but we recognize them, and we recognize their commitment to act. We will also invest heavily in global goods that support countries and companies alike. For example, we will make frequent high-resolution satellite imagery publicly available for free. Because transparency leads to accountability, and accountability leads, sooner or later, to change. We used to see monitoring as a transaction cost. Now we see it rather as a core strategy. Countries like Guyana and Gabon, with high forest cover and low deforestation, are best in class but have so far been far from adequately rewarded for their continuous effort to protect their forests. Norway has just this week announced a brand new results-based partnership with Gabon through the Central African Forest Initiative. Also this week, we announced um, 50 million US dollars in results-based payments to Guyana for outstanding forest results. Additionally, we will ramp up our support against international forest crimes. We will continue to support indigenous peoples around the world. And we will strengthen further our support to the global civil society. Finally, we will continue to broaden the global social movement to end deforestation. Early next year, we will again announce a new call for proposals for the NICFI civil society scheme where we give non-governmental organizations, globally or locally, financial support to continue their ambitious fight to end deforestation. Dear friends, I am confident that as we go forward, the UN RED program will continue to play a key role in supporting countries with forest planning, implementing good development policies, and in helping countries enable the climate mitigation potential for forests. As we are gathered here in New York, we have a unique opportunity to increase global action, awareness, and make a historic collective cross-sectoral commitment to achieve our climate goals. 10 years ago, countries and companies debated whether to act. Now we are debating how. Thank you very much. So, we want to hear a little bit from you about what can we actually do to scale up this ambition on forestry. And I wanted to start with Selena, because um, many of you have either read about or participated in the March on Fridays, but I know that Selena also participated in the Global Youth Forum yesterday. So, what are the messages that come from that forum and from you to us? What is it that you're requesting us to do. Mm, thanks so much, Mette. Um, yeah, so we had a, a, the first ever UN Youth uh, Climate Summit yesterday, um, and it brought together a thousand different young people from 140 different countries. Um, and that was in a, itself very incredible, but to be honest, it was quite an, an emotional uh, experience for me, and I think for a lot of people in the room. Um, and I've been working I guess in this, this space of youth activism, advocacy for four years now. Um, but yesterday was, yesterday and Friday, I think it was the first time that I, I didn't just say it was a climate emergency or, or know that it was, but I really felt it. Um, and as much as there was hope in the room, there was also a, lo a lot of tears, to be honest. People sharing that, you know, 50% of their hometown has recently been destroyed from a weather event. Um, and just asking us, you know, if this, if 50% of New York was destroyed in one moment, wouldn't we say it was an emergency? Wouldn't we do something about it? And we had no answer. You know, this is this is not just about climate. It's it's about 
justice. It's about acknowledging that every human life is is equal, and that you know we that every home and land is is equally valuable. And um, that was just a, a key belief I think that resonated through everyone yesterday. That this is something that we have to do on behalf of humanity and to be on the right side of history. And um, that, yeah, it's, it, climate change isn't that looming thing that we can casually kind of talk about and, and discuss from a distance, but it's, it's real. Uh, and in that way, I think we've been really encouraged and activated. Um, and I think that it's important that we, as we go into this week, um, the first time actually I, sp I came to an international event was in 2015 in Paris. And, and that in itself was a really pivotal moment and special. Um, but I think this week is, is another one of those moments where we, we have to step it up. Um, and you've seen close to four million people around the world strike on Friday. That is absolutely incredible. I, I was in the metro, I'm sure some of you were going, and there's this little eight-year-old boy uh, who's absolutely terrified to actually be in the metro with that many people. But he was still clinging on to his, his sign of the earth painted and then his dad's pant leg to just get through it and, and get to this march. Um, and I think that is is absolutely incredible. We've reached maybe a social tipping point where people are, are really demanding for change. Um, and I think it's important that we talk about now, how do we translate this this street you know, rage into action or, or protest in, into partnership and, and channel this energy in a way that can really contribute to climate solutions. Um, and that was part of the discussion yesterday. Um, but I think it's something that we definitely need to do to do better, especially when it comes, it comes to forests. This is something that young people are excited about, so many signs about planting trees and um, the, the importance of forests. But I think we need to do we need to take a step forward and really, um, one, maybe showing up where youth are um, and engaging with them in that and having that conversation, building up their knowledge in terms of what does it mean, how complicated or nuanced it actually is. We can't just plant trees everywhere, um, but really provide them with, with the guidance um, and the support and the knowledge that has been built up over the past 10, 20 years about this issue. Um, so I think that's, that's a key role that I feel um, someone like me who studied forestry and um, who was part of the International Forestry Students Association, that's, that is a, a responsibility that we have as young people to really engage the others in, in educating them. Um, but I also think that there's really valuable conversations that we need to have in terms of how do we as, as um, development organizations, as countries better utilize this energy to, um, to have youth be a driving force into teaching us how to move faster and quicker um, and being really aligned with our, our priorities. Um, so I hope I can perhaps touch on that a bit later, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that we need to talk about and strategize about to make sure that the next 10 years is, is aligned with, with the youth movement, that they're not just in the streets, but we're, we're really building a new world and vision for ourselves together. Um, yeah, so. Salina, tell me, I mean, we have had a lot of engagement, a lot of activities leading up to this because it's a UN climate summit. How do we keep the momentum going? I think one, one, the momentum will continue going, um, for sure. The young people will continue to protest and, and um, show up. And I think as the situation gets worse, we're going to see the whole world come out. Um, and I think we have a responsibility to make sure that 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 it happens, but we're also pulling them in to talk about how we can prevent that from happening. Ideally, we don't have millions of people in the street asking for their political leaders to do something. Um, so, but, but I think we, we have the, the necessary tools and knowledge to be able to really capitalize on that. I don't think it's far out of our reach. Um, but I do think from the forestry sector, there's a, f a few key questions or things that we need to, to talk about in order to do that. Um, the first one is, is education, and that's, that's twofold. One is, is purely curriculum, traditional education. What are we teaching people in university? Um, are people excited to actually um, be able to study this and have their lives contributing to the, to the solution in and, and forests? Um, and the second is the learning beyond the classroom. Um, and that's another space where we really need to utilize. If people aren't studying forestry, how can they, they take their mechanical engineering background and utilize this to kind of drive forward what we're doing? Um, and then the other thing is, is really, as a country, I would say 
looking to what is what is our economy going to look like? What what is employment going to look like in the future? How do we channel the the creative energy that people have um, to be able to move forward climate solutions and have that be a bigger piece of how we're we're making money? And I think f for young people in a large part of the world, that's that's going to be the first question: is is what can how can I provide for myself and build a career here? Um, and I think there's an opportunity for that, but I think there's ways that we can really um, ask that question better and align with um, development plans. Um, and then lastly, we talked a bit yesterday with um, young people about how do we um, help our countries do more. Um, I think young people uh, were a little pesky sometimes, <laughs> uh, but I think people have to build an appetite for disruption. Uh, you have to get comfortable with the questions that we will ask that make everyone uncomfortable. Um, this happened a lot yesterday. So we had someone from Microsoft and someone just stood up and was like, okay, why are you partnering with this oil and gas company? Um, a really bold question. And rather than shutting that down, I think, he, I mean, he engaged in the conversation um, and being honest about what, where there are shortfalls, where there will be improvements. Um, so I think if, if everyone builds a little bit more of an appetite for that, um, we'll really be able to, to partner a lot better because I mean, we, we can't be silent, so we're going to say it. So we might as well just get comfortable with it. Thank you, Selina. As clearly, we need to have many more conversations with youth and with the young uh, representatives of the youth organizations as well. Uh, we need to listen to what is being shouted very loud on the streets all over the world. It was fantastic to see what happened on Friday. But we also, of course, need to find a solution to how we actually respond to the request there. So I'd like to now hand over to... Dr. Agus from Indonesia, who will talk a little bit about um, how Red Plus is part of the nature-based solutions for climate change in Indonesia. What are some of the solutions that you have already found? Yes, <coughs> thank you. Uh, <coughs> Indonesia is deeply uh, grateful uh, to the UN Red for assisting of the government of Indonesia in the past, especially in the in attending the Red Plus readiness through uh, its support. <coughs> uh, Red Plus is program in the forestry sector that has a large uh, contribution in achieving the NDC target. In the context of Red Plus, uh, Indonesia has uh, demonstrated a strong commitment to reducing emission throughout uh, international negotiation and to prevent the rise of the earth temperature from worsening the negative impact of the current uh, climate. Indonesia has done uh, important things in the preparation phase, transformation phase, and now ahead of the full implementation of phase of RED. A number of RED plus infrastructure have been uh, established, including the national RED plus strategy. We have uh, forest reference emission level, Monitoring, reporting, and verification or MRV system, national forest monitoring system, funding instrument, and the safeguard implementation information system. A number of ministerial uh, regulations have been produced as a guideline to implement Red Plus in Indonesia. The area of Red Plus implementation has been designated. FREL was submitted. MRV system as part of transparency framework was built, uh, and national registry system was launched. This had been connected to the existing regulation both of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry and other uh, relevant uh, ministries as well as policy produced by uh, former RDD Plus such as a national Red Plus strategy and also provincial action plan strategy. Those instruments uh, will help us implement Red Plus result-based payment management. We have issued uh, and reinforced the implementation of policy suspending the issuance of new permit for utilizing primary forest and peatland. With better environmental government, we have significantly reduced the rate of deforestation. We combine our new forest and environmental management with law enforcement through multi-doors and multi-layer approaches. The red Plus scheme has been recognized as uh, contributing significantly to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from the land-based sector. Red Plus has also become a tool in accelerating, accelerating the realization of good forest governance. 
while the current global condition carbon emission from the land sector are still at 18 to 20%. Therefore, the UNFCCC needs to emphasize the implementation of the Red Plus scheme as the main program in land-based development in its country. Indonesia experience in conducting Red Plus readiness shows that multi-stakeholder engagement is the key in improving Red Plus awareness throughout the country. Factual challenges uh, related forest management in Indonesia, including land conflicts and then overlapping permits, recognition of local and customary communities, misperception, human resources capacity, land and forest fire. Indonesia now has ongoing effort that is a social forestry program for reducing and preventing deforestation at the same time providing economic and livelihood. Also as an approach to work with the indigenous communities as a guardian of the earth. Integrating regulation on social forestry aims for placing a foundation to provide a greater access for communities, especially to those living inside in surrounding state forests, to utilize forest resources and to resolve conflicts. Well, thank you very much. I mean, Indonesia, when we first started the UN Red program, Indonesia was one of the pilot countries, and I thought, wow, that's quite a challenge. Indonesia is a huge country with many islands, a huge population pressure, and many issues. Um, so if Indonesia can make it, anybody else can too. So I really think there's been fantastic progress in Indonesia and want to congratulate you on what you have achieved so far. We know Indonesia is also one of the champions in the better conservation of peatlands and sharing some of their information from their experiences over years with other countries in that regard as well. So I now hear that we also have a representative from Uganda here. So I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Mr. Chebet Maikut, who is the Commissioner at the Climate Change Department, Ministry of Water and Environment, and the UNFCCC National Focal Point for Uganda. Please, sir, come up here and take a seat. And we're actually going to hand over the microphone to you straight away. Uh, so we'd like to sort of move from, from Indonesia to Africa. Tell us a little bit about your experiences and some of the successes and challenges that you've had in Uganda in terms of Red Plus. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mete, and a very good morning to you all. First of all, apologies for coming late. I got lost a bit. Now, I'm going to be very brief because I don't know how much time I have. Now, for the case of Uganda, Obviously, the aspect of forestry in general is one of our key uh, solutions to addressing the problem of climate change. And perhaps I can reflect with you, I mean, uh, share my experience briefly on the work so far done with respect to Red Plus. The government of Uganda has gone through the process of the Red Plus readiness process. All the phases are accomplished, including the strategy preparation. Of course, we started with the plan, the organization. And uh, right now, the government of Uganda has already launched it is Red Plus strategy. It is in place within the ambit of the broader climate change framework and other relevant government development frameworks. In our NDC, under the Paris Agreement, Forestry is very key, very, very key. So what have we done so far? <clears throat> Again, based on the process of stakeholder engagement, leaving nobody behind, involving everybody on matters of forestry, we have moved some milestone in fulfilling the fundamentals that are now providing clear framework for going into actions. And already some actions are already ongoing in terms of Red Plus. Now, on the national, uh, the national forest uh, monitoring system, the government has put in place a robust framework, including some mission of forest emission reverence levels, which we submitted to the UNFCCC. And uh, as I speak now, work is in progress to uh, to, to review, so to say, 
and submit a, a new updated uh, forest reference emission level to the UNFTPC by early next year. So that's where we are. And uh, I don't, maybe I can stop here for the time being and wait for the question. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we will come back to you, but it's clear that we've heard, he heard here that we need to be better at involving all the stakeholders in terms of making sure that action is actually sustainable in the long term. But I want to now come back to Peter from World Conservation Monitoring Center. I don't know if you've all seen the video that was circulated with Greta Thunberg and George Monbiot. Protect, restore, and fund. That's the mantra. So, Peter fund, finance, where do we get it from? What do we do? Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the panelists for a really good uh, uh, conversation. Um, I think we all acknowledged um, that uh, nature-based solutions are really crucial for the climate emergency. But I think the main challenge is how do we uh, finance them, right? And I think... Um, I, I might share some of the um, experiences that the, the UNEP and WCMC have been doing, um, but I will stick to uh, uh, three things. I think one thing is um, how do you stimulate finance? I think that's the, the first question. And I think what the um, UN environment or UNEP has been doing is how do you connect um, countries that are working on Red Plus with private sector, uh, public funds, and um, some donors in how to invest on Red Plus activities or forest-related activities, and mostly the land use sector as, as, as a whole. I think that's one thing that we need really to do. And I think when we do that, we need also to make sure that we... Um, we ensure social and environmental integrity on that. Um, the second thing is um, that something that the UN environment has been doing is really to facilitate deals in terms of how do you connect, uh, how do you serve as a, as a trusted and uh, um, as a trusted broker with uh, uh, donors in terms of uh, um, uh, payment, uh, result-based payment in terms of uh, carbon transactions, and really trying to get them to understand um, the rationale behind doing that by also creating some funding mechanism that will unlock um, uh, funding in the future. I think the last thing and the third thing is how do you create enabling conditions? I think within the countries, there are so many uh, schemes now um, but country, at the country level, they need really to understand how to navigate in these schemes and how to create conditions in which investment can really come in and land into the country, also can be integrated into um, the, the national policy, mainstreamed into the national policy. I think that, was, that is something that um, even the minister has said it, how do we create this policy within the country. We believe that investment, if we really want investment to land in the country, we really need the countries to have those conditions at one point. Because if, whether we bring private money, whether we bring donors money, there are a lot of requirements and countries have to comply. And one of the things that we've been doing is really try to work with the countries and try to train the countries and walk the country through uh, these schemes. I think I can share some examples. Uh, for example, uh, we have one partnership today that we're launching in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we call One for 20. It's a partnership in which we try to mobilize uh, about $1 billion to um, support countries' national strategy uh, red strategy of increasing forest by 20%. So this is the country in Africa where everyone could think um, investment could be a problem, right? But they have commodity, which is cocoa. And cocoa is the major uh, uh, deforestation, driver's deforestation in Cote d'Ivoire. The country has developed its own strategy by saying we will increase our forest cover by 20%, but they don't know how. Actually, then we discussed with the country to say, what will be that strategy? Then they went to say, no, we will go through agroforestry. 
So with agroforestry system, we need really to try to understand what could be the model that will work well. So our role was really much to try to develop economic viability first, to see what model could work either for farmers or for agribusiness and the country. The second is now to create those scalable and the bankable projects in which investment can come and we connect them with investors. But the third thing is to create enabling conditions in which countries will really allow this investment to land. And the, third, uh, and the last thing was very much try to create these stakeholder dialogues so that they can have exchange, experience exchange. I think one last thing that I would like maybe to say um, is, you know, the price of carbon. I think we need really to think about that. Um, right now, um, if we see how much uh, is the, the forest carbon uh, price in the market, it's about $5 or $6. It doesn't create good incentives, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, during this discussion, we could also think about how do we maybe bring it three or four folds? you know, so that it can create incentive within the countries um, as well. So these few examples and these few words, these are the projects, the small projects that have been uh, done in, 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 in some countries. We have uh, another example with TLFF in Indonesia, where some private banks have committed some money to really uh, go sustainably to produce sustainable uh, commodity. These are small projects, but this project can be scaled up. As we talk about how to increase the ambitions, again, if we go for private sector, this is, these are the examples of the project that can be scaled. If we go through the countries, these are the examples that they can also take on to say we can increase our ambition, we can use this to mainstream into our policy and the governance, and also to the donors that, and, and private sector, um, and NGOs that we're working to say, you know, these are the small projects that we can actually scale up. I think, you know, this is an opportunity also to say we need to double the ambitions, but we need also to build on some of the projects that are working on the ground. Thank you, Peter. I like the fact that Peter talks about small projects and $1 billion. I, I really like that. That's, that's scaling up ambition, I think. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience, if anybody has some, otherwise I'll start with some as well. So we have a roving mic, more or less. Um, at least I can bring one to you. If anybody has a question to any of our panelists up here, now's the chance. Yes, Fred. Well, we want to have it for our interpretation. We can give you mine. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, I, I had two questions. I want to, uh, Agus, uh, of course, Indonesia brought down deforestation and that's a, a great feat, but currently, again, fires in Borneo, etc., many fires, and so part of the Red Plus is still not working, and I would like to, to hear your comment about it. Like, what is, I know it's a dry year, an El Nino year, so that's always difficult, but still, like, if, if all the red plus issues would be in, in place, hopefully there would have been less fire. Like and that, and, and the question for Salina is like, um, it's great to see the, the interest of people and demonstrations, but um, in many of the countries where forest is an issue, uh, they're not the most highly democratic countries in the world and, and demonstrations might not be um, that well regarded. So how do we get in those countries that traction, uh, not that it's useful to get the traction here and in other countries, but how we get that more in those countries where it's not that easy to demonstrate ag against government policies. Okay. Yes, <coughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, regarding deforestation, yeah, we, we have uh, experience uh, that we can reduce our deforestation and I have a data from the 2014 until 2015, the deforestation, the deforestation rate in Indonesia is around 1.09 million hectares. And then from 2015 to 2016, 0.63 million hectares. And then 2016 to 2017, 0.48 million hectares. 
and from 2017 to 2018, point forty-four million hectares. But now, uh, regarding the forest fire, you you see that we are facing a uh, very uh, difficult uh, situation. As you know, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the 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 problem is very complex because uh, so many uh, factor uh, uh, involved in that uh, fire. But uh, we are now uh, getting. Uh, uh, I can I can tell you that uh, the, the the government has a full commitment to 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 handle the fire, but uh, up to now we are still struggling, and hopefully uh, due to the the rainfall uh, already coming, we do hope that the the fire can be uh, handled. But the problems itself regarding the fire is deal with the social uh, factor, yeah, because. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of uh, uh, preparation for for uh, activities regarding uh, uh, estate and also uh, farming, and for for example, oil palm. So they have to prepare uh, by land burning, but they are not anticipating that there is a, 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 a climate that are not. Uh, suitable for, for, for burning. So uh, we do hope that even we still uh, uh, facing with the, the fire, but we can uh, also maintain our uh, rate of deforestation uh, can be reduced. Thank you. Salina? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, because I think it's very important um, to discuss it. I think the way we've seen it, kind of the conversation at the moment, has been largely um, kind of crediting the protests for building the political will and momentum, um, but it's not the best pathway. Um, I, my, I myself, I'm from Eritrea, a country in East Africa, that it, that is not a recommended, I think climate action protest isn't a way I would say we can drive forward change as young people or any individual. Um, so I think in, in these situations, in these contexts, we discuss this a bit as uh, the African youth group as well, um, in terms of we, we want to have influence um, and we need to think about how do we need to potentially drop our agenda um, and learn how to partner in order to create the change that we want given the conditions that exist. Um, and so actually I would say the two organizations I've worked heavily with, um, IFSA, uh, the Forestry Students Association is a non-political um, organization that really the one thing we advocate for is, is bet better education. Um, so we're an NGO that kind of focuses purely on science, but our advocacy is very um, limited intentionally because we want to look at how do we create more spaces for young people um, to learn and to have opportunities. Um, and removing ourselves from the political conversation is a great asset to have young people um, be present and to learn. Um, so that's that's one way I think we really should promote um, and support the groups that are taking those stances and positions. Um, there's a low risk for everyone involved and I think a lot of opportunity. Um, and the other thing is also the Global Landscapes Forum is, is another platform where it's a multi-stakeholder space to discuss and it's rooted in science and knowledge. And I think if, if we promote these spaces to, to talk about practice, um, science, knowledge, things that we, we can't debate about, just pure fact, um, that would be one way to really involve young people um, uh, in a way that I think is, is, is meaningful and will promote the change that we want. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing. Also, from, from a national kind of perspective, getting more young people involved in, in the negotiations, uh, I think, is really important. And it, it involves building trust, and um, to do that, I think we you have to really find those youth groups and promote the ones that are, are choosing to take that stance. So that's my advice. Thank you, Selina. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Okay, I want to give you um, a chance to also sort of have a final say of what is the message you want to send out to the world. Uh, today. We had to, of course, unfortunately say goodbye to Chebit. He had to attend another meeting at uh, 10 o'clock, so he was running from here to another event of elsewhere in town with his minister so that they are they're ready for the... As you know, today there will be a, a meeting as well looking at the nature-based solutions, so he had to go with his minister. 
Now, if you were to come up with sort of one key message or a pitch to the world or t and to this audience here, what would it be? Who wants to start? We've heard a little bit about how we need to engage stakeholders, how we need to engage the youth, embrace what they're saying and seeing how we can respond to it. We've heard a bit about how we could do it at the national level, what some of the challenges are. And we've heard about the small projects of $1 billion. I still can't get over that. Uh, but um, so let's hear, uh, what is it? What else do we need to do? Who wants to start? Okay. okay. Yeah, um, I think two things from my side. One is really uh, what I said, we have to mobilize uh, finance. And this mobilizing finance will be uh, private and the public uh, finance. I think that's one key uh, thing. And the way we mobilize this finance uh, is really trying to uh, develop some bankable and scalable uh, project. And this should be of interest of uh, donors, uh, private companies, but also countries. I think the second thing for me is that um, we need to also double ambitions of the countries. I think at the country level, people have really to think about uh, how do we mainstream uh, climate action into our own policies and governance so that we also uh, attract some of these uh, uh, fundings to invest in our countries. And I think that's the role that uh, all of us can play uh, to work with the countries to try to create those enabling conditions. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, for me, uh, for us, is our natural resources. It is our future. Uh, we are eager to manage our forest in sustainable manner and we are open to for collaboration. Our uh, president is fully concerned about the management of our forest, including uh, peatland and mangrove management. We formulate and apply our good forest management to contribute to global effort in controlling emissions for the better future. Thank you. Uh, and I guess from my side, um, this upcoming Saturday, we're going to try our own hand at building partnerships. Um, so at the Global Landscapes Forum, we're bringing um, Extinction Rebellion um, leaders, Fridays for Future, others, um, to talk about how can young people be a part of this movement towards restoration um, and nature-based solutions. Um, so I would invite everyone to join us uh, for that. Um, it's going to be an, an interesting um, discussion to see how we can align and, and move that action forward. Um, but I would also encourage everyone to, to do that, to have that same conversation on a local and country level is to see how you can bring these people together to really scale up our actions on, on this topic. Okay, and from the United Nations, representing both the food and agriculture organizations, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Environment Program, I want to say that we have been very privileged to follow the progress that's happened in the 65 countries that we have worked with for over a decade. We are committed to continuing to provide the support to those countries to help increase the climate ambitions, to help increase the mitigation efforts that forests can provide, to help reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. We were the first joint UN global program on climate change. I think we have shown that through the efforts we have built the confidence that you can achieve a reduction of in, in deforestation and forest degradation, that you can do it in a transparent and open manner, and that that can lead to climate finance. From the Global Climate Fund, we know that some of the countries that we've been working with are just on the cusp of getting their first payment for results that they have proven that have already taken place on the ground. We know we can do better, we know that we can help them increase ambitions and through that help develop solutions to the climate emergency. Life is better with forests. Thank you.